Good morning. I'm Melissa Green, a Technology Accessibility Specialist with the Center for Instructional Technologies Technology Accessibility Team. The Center for Instructional Technology, or CIT, is a unit of the university's Office of Information Technology, and the Technology Accessibility Team works to ensure that all technology users, including those with disabilities, have a functional and accessible technology experience. With the university's websites and the technologies we use for teaching, learning and administrative functions. You can find more information about our efforts on our website at accessibility.ua.edu. During today's session, we'll talk about steps to take to make your course materials more inclusive and accessible to all. Whether you're creating those in Blackboard, Microsoft Office, Adobe Acrobat, or other authoring tools. I'll also briefly demonstrate Blackboard Ally for LMS, a product that integrates with the Blackboard Learning Management System to help make digital course content more accessible. A quick moment for housekeeping. This slide includes a picture of me. I have my webcam turned off, but I thought you might like to see who you're speaking with today. To improve audio quality, I have muted everyone by default, but when you wish to speak, you can select the microphone icon in the Zoom control bar to mute or unmute yourself. You can also choose to have your camera on or off, uh, but please do mute your microphone when you're not speaking. When I'm talking or sharing my screen, uh, please indicate in the chat box if you can't see or hear something. You're welcome to use that chat box throughout. I may not be watching closely while I'm talking, uh, but I'll do my best to check it every once in a while. And if I don't see your question or comment immediately, um, I will come back to those at the end. The session is being recorded. We'll make it available on our YouTube channel. Um, if you register for the webinar, I'll send you a link to that recording, along with links to resources shared during the session. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Ensuring your course content is accessible is vital if learners with disabilities are to be able to access and interact with your materials. Uh, but accessible course content is really more useful and usable for everyone. Um, every course is different, but there are some principles you can apply with minimal effort in every course that will have a major impact on learners' ability to access, engage with content, and learn. And these principles can be applied whether you're creating content in the Blackboard Learning Management System itself or creating documents, web, or other digital content for instructional purposes. The first principle is to use actual text, not images of text. Whether it's text in a document or a presentation file or text you've added using the Blackboard editor, it's important that the text is readable to both visual and non-visual users. To do this, you should use actual text rather than images of text. Um, and this slide includes examples of both. On the left side of the slide, we have an image of text, um, the poem, Nothing Gold Can Stay by Robert Frost. On the right side of the slide is the same poem, uh, the text. However, it's in text format rather than an image of the text. While it's possible to describe images of text in such a way that assistive technology users can access those descriptions, uh, providing actual text offers several advantages over images of text. Screen readers can read text. Um, Pardon me for just one moment, I need to clear my throat. Excuse me. Um, screen readers can read actual text. Learners with low vision may need to enlarge the page or screen and actual text scales better than most images of text. Learners can search for text content. A text loads more easily for learners with poor network connections. And from a content creation standpoint, from a workflow standpoint, it's easier and faster to edit text than it is to edit an image of text with image editing software, save it, and upload it to a course. 
When working with text, avoid small font sizes. We like to use a font size of at least 12. This slide includes screenshots of the Blackboard Editor and the font size box in the Microsoft Word Home tab. The ability to change font size is present in both. You should also ensure sufficient contrast between the text in the foreground and the background color of the page or of the document. A text is much easier to read when there is sufficient contrast between the foreground text color and the background color. Low contrast text can be hard for learners with visual disabilities or color vision deficiency, also known as color blindness. It's also difficult to read when projected in class or on a mobile device. Um, with a bright light or glare on the screen um, or on a low quality monitor. Poor contrast can also cause eye strain. Um, it can make content harder to discover or scan. Good contrast means everyone can see the text clearly and enjoy a better overall reading experience. The Web Content Accessibility Guidelines or WCAG define a formula for determining sufficient contrast. And we think that's a good guideline to go by across content types, whether um, you're designing content for the web or not. Tools such as WebAIM's Color Contrast Checker and the Paciello Group's Color Contrast Analyzer make it easy to check contrast thresholds and determine if your color combination uh, meets WCAG guidelines. This slide includes a screenshot of text that fails to meet WCAG contrast requirements as determined by the WebAIM color contrast checker. The foreground text color is gray and the background color is a slightly lighter shade of gray. Uh, the color contrast checker WebAIM's tool um, is an online tool. It's freely available. The way it works is that you enter the hexadecimal or hex codes for your color combinations. Um, text and background and it will inform you whether um, the contrast is sufficient. The other tool I mentioned, the Paciello Group's Color Contrast Analyzer is also free, but it's desktop software, so it's something you install on your computer. Um, you can enter in color codes or it has an eyedropper tool you can use to select um, the text in the foreground and the background color to see if that combination meets uh, contrast requirements. Another principle to keep in mind when working with color is not using color alone to convey meaning. When working with color, you must make sure that color isn't your only method of conveying important information. An example of using color alone to convey meaning uh, might be providing a list of readings and putting the required readings in red. Um, someone who can't see to see red or someone who has difficulty distinguishing red from other colors, they would miss out on that important information uh, which of the readings is required. So you can use color, um, however, when you use color to convey meaning or information, it's important to use another means of conveying that information as well. And this is primarily to ensure your content is accessible to people who have color vision deficiency, but it's also a principle of universal design for learning. By using more than just color to convey information, you're providing multiple means of representation to so multiple ways of um, the learner picking up on the content. This slide depicts one approach to using more than just color to convey meaning. Um, this is a screenshot from the Trello project management system. It depicts colored labels used in Trello, both with and without the colorblind mode enabled. So when Trello's colorblind mode is enabled, both patterns and color not just color, are used to differentiate labels. I like this example because even if you don't use Trello, which I don't, um, you can apply this principle or this approach relatively easily in uh, other products. So for example, Microsoft Office, if you're creating uh, charts or graphs, um, let's say a pie chart, for example, and using color to distinguish the different slices of pie, you can also apply a pattern 
um, and not just use color in uh, the slices of pie and in your legend or key. Um, so I think this is a really great example of an approach that can be applied to use more than just color. There's some other strategies as well. Sometimes you'll see colored labels that also incorporate text or symbols, for example. A key accessibility principle is helping the user navigate to relevant content. One way to do this is by using proper heading styles. Uh, headings add structure and meaning to documents and web pages by labeling each content part um, and indicating the order and relative importance of those parts. And in order for your content to be accessible, it's important that you organize it using headings. Uh, someone who does not have full use of their vision can't see larger or bold font that we sometimes use to indicate titles, headings, or subheadings. Uh, but they can perceive the appropriate markup and use it to navigate through a document or web page or online course with their screen reader or other assistive technology like a switch or mouth stick used to access and control a computer or smartphone. You can add headings to Word documents and PowerPoint presentations using built-in styles. Uh, you can use the Blackboard editor to add headings wherever you can add and format text, such as in assignments, tests, discussions, blogs, and journal. Uh, the screenshots on the slide depict that. On the left side of the slide, we have a screenshot of the Blackboard editor um, that includes the ability to format text uh, as a paragraph or as uh, various headings. On the right side of the slide, we have a screenshot of the styles group in the Word Home tab, which again uh, depicts the ability to apply headings. Headings should follow a logical structure. Uh, the, the first heading in your document or in your content should be heading one, so your top level heading. Uh, followed by heading two for section headings, followed by heading three for subsection headings. Uh, typically normal um, or paragraph is used for paragraphs of text or just, just sort of default regular text that's not a heading. Along the same lines, uh, true lists rather than the appearance of lists, so rather than just bullet symbols or numeric characters should be used. Unordered lists, which usually are styled as bullets, should be used when there's no order of sequence or importance in your list. So if you could uh, rearrange all the items in a list and it really wouldn't make any difference to the list meaning, um, it should probably be formatted as an unordered list. Ordered lists, which usually appear as numbers or letters, suggest a progression or sequence or series of steps. You can add lists to Word documents and PowerPoint presentations using the built-in list functionality in Office, which is uh, depicted on the right side of the slide in a screenshot of the paragraph group of the Word Home tab. You can use the Blackboard editor to add lists wherever you can add and format text, such as in assignments, tests, discussions, blogs, and journals. And that is depicted in the screenshot on the left side of the slide, uh, which shows built-in list functionality. Describing images is another fundamental principle of digital accessibility. This slide includes two images with uh, sample or possible descriptions of those images. Uh, a painting is described as a classic painting demonstrating the use of light and color to create composition. On the right side of the slide, there is a pie chart um, that summarizes the results of a study. Um, it's actually titled, Questions People Lie About. Um, a sample description of this image might start with the words, this graph summarizes the survey results from a study um, and would go on to provide descriptive text. Image descriptions are read by screen readers, um, so they're vital for allowing the content and function of the image to be accessible 
to screen reader users, um, which are typically folks who have visual disabilities or perhaps certain cognitive disabilities. Uh, but an image description is also displayed in browsers if the image file is not loaded or when the user has chosen not to view images. Um, in terms of web content, an image description can also be read by search engines. Um, there are also teaching and learning benefits to providing image descriptions. Images can be a great way to provide multiple means of representation um, and can help to communicate complex ideas to students. Um, the descriptions of the images can provide deeper context to aid comprehension. Images can be described in alternative text associated with image files or in the context or surroundings of the image itself. Uh, you can add image descriptions using your document or presentation software or when adding images in the Blackboard editor. This slide includes screenshots of the Blackboard insert image from web dialog on the left side of the slide. And on the right side of the slide, there's a screenshot of the Microsoft Office 365 alt text dialog. The ability to provide alternative text for an image is present in both. Here's some guidance to follow when describing images. You want to describe the image based on its context, and you want to convey the full meaning of the image. So the same image um, in different contexts might have different meaning. For example, the script A um, that represents our university. In some contexts, it might be purely decorative. In others, um, it might require a brief description. Um, script A, UA logo. Um, in the context of, let's say, a graphic design course, we might go into even more detail about its appearance, that the red is a particular Pantone shade, or that the um, A has a certain number of serifs. So image descriptions are highly contextual. You want to keep the context of the image and the, why you're using the image in mind when describing it. Avoid saying image of or picture of. Screen readers automatically announce this information, um, so it's redundant in order in, uh, to include that in your image description. Description should be concise, um, unless it's a complex image like an infographic, in which case you might write a longer narrative. Um, you could put this narrative on the page immediately following the infographic, maybe including an anchor link at the top of the page to jump directly to the text description. Uh, but generally speaking, that image description should be concise. As we mentioned before, uh, you want to avoid images of text. If you can't avoid using an image of text, usually the text that's in the image makes the best description. So, uh, for example, that Robert Frost poem, Nothing Gold Can Stay, an appropriate description of that image would be the text of the poem itself. Say something new. Um, don't repeat descriptions on the same page um, or don't repeat what is already said on the page in the image description. Um, so you can describe images in an alt text field um, or in the context of the image itself. It's not necessary to do both. Finally, if you have a means of doing so, you want to identify images that don't represent relevant content as decorative. I'm going to return to the previous slide uh, where we have our screenshot of the Office 365 alt text dialog. Um, one thing to be aware of when adding alternative text in Office 365 is there's a checkbox labeled mark as decorative. So if an image really doesn't convey any meaning, if it doesn't have any purpose other than being decorative, um, you can select that checkbox to provide that information. Um, and that strategy is available sort of in different ways depending on what your authoring tool is. If you're working with HTML, you can provide what's known as null alternative text, which is alt equals quote quote um, with nothing in between those quotation marks. If you're working with a PDF, you have the ability to indicate that a figure is decorative. It really depends on what tool you're using. 
Um, so describe images that have meaning, um, keeping in mind their context or purpose. Um, and if you have the ability to do so, mark images that are decorative as such. Let's talk about tables. Uh, generally speaking, you should only use tables for data and not for visual layout. On the left side of this slide, there's an example of a data table. The table is titled Shelley's Daughters. It has three columns headed name, age, and birthday. It has two rows headed Jackie and Beth. On the right side of the slide, there is an example of a layout table. This table does not provide data or include tabular information. Rather, it's used to align a headshot photograph of the University of Alabama president with text. The purpose of data tables is to present tabular information in a grid or matrix and to have columns or rows that show the meaning of the information in the grid. So a sighted user can visually scan a table and quickly associate um, data in the table and the appropriate row and column headers. But someone that can't see a table can't make these visual associations. So we need to make sure we're using proper markup um, to indicate what the various elements in the table are. When the proper markup is in place, assistive technology users can navigate through a data table one cell at a time, and screen reader users will hear the column and row headers spoken to them. And this means they won't lose context as they navigate through the table. In order to, to do all this, you want to use simple tables. Uh, screen readers keep track of where you are in a table by counting cells and can lose count with complicated layouts. Wherever possible, you should avoid merging cells, splitting cells, or nesting tables and tables uh, because that can make table content difficult to navigate and understand. You should also avoid leaving rows or columns completely blank. This slide includes an example of a simple table um, that doesn't have merged or split cells um, or nested tables within a table. You can add table headers and associate them with table data using your document or presentation software or when adding tables in the editor. Um, so this is essentially indicating which cells in your table um, include data and which ones serve as headers. This slide includes screenshots of the Blackboard Table Cell Properties option that you access from the editor and the Table Tools tab in Microsoft Word and the ability to designate table headers or indicate which cells in the table serve as column or row headers is present in both. Another basic principle of digital accessibility is making sure links make sense out of context by avoiding generic phrases like click here and more as link text. This is especially important because screen reader users often navigate from link to link, skipping the text in between, or use a keyboard shortcut to view a list of all the links present on the page. When you add a hyperlink to your course content or navigation, ask yourself, if you read the link text out of context, would you understand what the link is for and what selecting the link will do? You should also alert the user when the link leads to a non-HTML resource, like a PDF, Word, or PowerPoint file. You can do this by indicating the format of the content you're linking to in parentheses, uh, but you want, if you do this, you want to make sure that the parenthetical information, so parentheses PDF or parentheses PowerPoint, is part of the actual link text, not just unlinked text immediately following it. URLs as link text should usually be avoided. So an example of that might be uh, linking to a YouTube video. YouTube URLs are um, pretty unruly. They're long and they include um, a lot of alphanumeric characters. So if you just use the URL itself, 
as link text that really doesn't have a lot of meaning. Um, however, if you're linking to a YouTube video and used the title of the video as link text and indicated that you're linking to a YouTube video, that's going to tell the user, you know, exactly what to expect when they click on the link. This slide includes a screenshot of the create web link function in the Blackboard editor. The ability to provide a descriptive link title is present as it also is in Microsoft Office. We've already touched on some principles that address file accessibility, but I'd like to share some additional tips for two specific types of files, Microsoft Office content and PDFs. This slide depicts Microsoft's tips for creating inclusive content. We've covered some of these tips already, like uh, using built-in styles and templates with fonts and colors that are easy to see, making content easy to navigate by including section headings, slide titles, and sheet names, giving hyperlinks meaningful display names, describing visual objects with alternative text, and avoiding using color as the sole means of representing important information. What we haven't talked about yet is the accessibility checker. Like the Microsoft Office spelling checker tells you about possible spelling errors, the accessibility checker in Word, PowerPoint, Excel, and Outlook on the web tells you about possible accessibility issues in your Office files. The tool generates a report of issues that could make your content difficult for people with disabilities to understand. Um, it explains why you should fix these issues and how to fix them. We recommend using the checker to evaluate and repair your files before uploading them to Blackboard or otherwise sharing them with your students. In newer versions of Office, including Office 365, you can access the accessibility checker via the review tab. In older versions, you can access the accessibility checker by going to the file tab and choosing info, check for issues, check accessibility. After you run the accessibility checker, you'll see a list of errors, warnings, and tips with how to fix recommendations for each. This is shown in a screenshot on the right side of this slide. Moving on to PDFs, although there's a bit more to it than this, when people talk about accessible PDF files, they're usually referring to PDF files that at minimum have searchable, selectable text and tags. Uh, tags really serve as the basis of an accessible PDF file. They indicate the structure of the document, uh, communicate the order in which items should be read, and determine exactly which items will be read. The image on the left side of this slide shows a PDF document open in Adobe Acrobat Pro. The tags panel is open, showing that the text in this document is tagged with the heading one, heading two, and paragraph tags. The image on the right side of the slide shows skewed text that often serves as an indicator or a clue that a PDF has been created from scanning. The issue with scanned text or um, scan PDFs created from scanned text is that these PDFs often lack actual text, tags, or both. So it's best to replace them with proper digital text documents, just as we talked about not using images of text and using actual text instead. If the text can be found in the library, you might provide a link to the library resource instead, as many library resources are available in multiple formats from which the learner can select the one that works best for them. If the text can be found in the library, you should minimally use OCR or optical character recognition to convert any scanned text to actual text before sharing the file. You can do this using the Adobe Acrobat Pro software uh, that all UA users have access to at no charge as part of our Creative Cloud license. 
Um, if you need assistance doing that, we are happy to help. There is more to an accessible PDF than just text though. Remember, an accessible PDF has tags. When exporting a document or presentation as PDF, you want to check your export settings to make sure that the resulting PDF will be tagged. After exporting the file, you might use the Adobe Acrobat Pro Accessibility Checker to identify and fix any accessibility issues. The Accessibility Checker is one of two tools Adobe Acrobat Pro offers that can assist content authors in creating accessible PDFs. It's depicted in a screenshot on the left side of this slide. The other is the Make Accessible Action, which walks you through the steps required to make a PDF accessible. It prompts you to address accessibility issues, such as a missing document description or title, it looks for common elements that need further action, such as scan text, form fields, tables, and images. Um, I use both of these tools. Sort of the difference in how I use them is that if I have created the source file, so the Microsoft Word document or the PowerPoint presentation, or I have access to that source file and have the ability to make it as accessible as possible, before saving it as a PDF, um, and I have the ability to save it in such a way that preserves tags and other accessibility information. Um, after creating the PDF, I'll then use the accessibility checker just to check my work and make any necessary touch-ups. If I don't have access to the source file, um, or if the document is very complex, like a scanned text, then I might use the Make Accessible Action Wizard um, to make that file more accessible uh, because it will walk me through the entire process. So if it's a file I have control over, I think that there are very few changes that might need to be made. The full check tends to work better for me. Um, if it's a more complex document, or if I don't have access to the source file, I tend to use the Make Accessible Action Wizard. And again, these are both tools available through Adobe Acrobat Pro, um, which is available at no cost to UA users. Many instructors share audio and video content in our courses. Um, in order to ensure your audio and video content is accessible, you must provide captions transcripts, and, when necessary, audio descriptions. Captions are text that appear on a video to match its soundtrack, including dialogue and nonverbal sounds like thunder or dog barking. The screenshot on the left side of this slide shows a caption video playing in the YouTube player. Here, captions appear in white text on a black background in the lower third of the video above the player controls. A transcript is a written record of a video or audio recording. Uh, it may or may not include descriptions of filler sounds like um or uh. An example of an NPR interview transcript is shown on the right side of the slide. In the transcript, speakers are identified by their names and titles with their words transcribed exactly as the speaker says them. Captions can be built from a transcript by breaking the text up into small segments called caption frames and synchronizing them with the media so that each caption frame can be displayed at the right time. Audio descriptions narrate the visual parts of a video and are played in between the video's dialogue and other essential sounds. The slide includes two still shots of the YouTube video player. In the first, two hands are holding a tablet computer, and the associated audio description is a man is using a tablet by voice. In the second, a hand is typing on a laptop keyboard, and the associated audio description is a woman with her arm in a sling is typing on a keyboard. Um, so those phrases, a man is using a tablet by voice, or a woman with her arm in a sling is typing on a keyboard, uh, would be played in between 
the dialogue or other essential sounds in the video to provide important information about what's happening visually in the video. Audio descriptions are necessary for users with visual disabilities, but offer benefits for all. I usually mention here that I enjoy listening to audio described content on Netflix um, with my eyes closed when I have a migraine or while falling asleep. In a teaching or and learning context, audio descriptions share similarities with image descriptions in that they provide multiple means of representation, uh, so multiple ways of communicating information. Uh, they can help communicate complex ideas and provide deeper context to aid comprehension. If a video is produced with accessibility in mind, then audio descriptions are often unnecessary, um, as long as visual elements within the video are described in the audio. So, for example, you don't need audio description for talking heads only. Um, so just a speaker kind of delivering a, a monologue of sorts. Um, you don't need audio description for text on slides, as long as the slide text is woven into what you say. You might need audio description um, of things like charts and diagrams, um, if those are included in the slides and you otherwise aren't describing them. Okay, um, let's talk about Blackboard Ally for LMS. In order to support the transition to online learning, Blackboard Ally for LMS has been enabled in all current and future courses, uh, Blackboard courses. Ally helps make digital course content more accessible by automatically providing alternative formats, such as semantic HTML, audio, EPUB, and electronic Braille. Ally also provides instructor feedback and guidance on correcting accessibility issues in a course. Let's take a look at how it works. First, Ally uses machine learning algorithms to automatically provide alternative formats for course content throughout your entire institution. This gives students immediate access to more accessible alternatives such as semantic HTML, audio, EPUB, electronic braille, and more, without any manual intervention from the institution or instructor. Ally also checks and scores course content it then provides feedback and detailed guidance on how to fix the identified accessibility issues to the instructor, all within the context of the learning management system. This allows instructors to see which items in their course have accessibility issues and fix them before students start to use the content. Lastly, Ally provides a means to understand how the institution is doing in terms of accessibility and analyzes course content into an institution-wide report. This report provides administrators a deep and rich understanding of not only how the institution is performing, but how things are evolving and where the problems are. With this kind of insight, informed decisions can be made into how to further improve accessibility at the institution. Ally quickly provides a level of insight that most institutions don't have access to. All of Ally's features work together to move any institution up on the accessibility spectrum, from the automated generation of alternative accessible formats to in-context instructor feedback and institutional reporting. Ally works hard in making course content more accessible. So taking a closer look at the three ways Ally helps instructors make course content more accessible. Uh, first, Ally creates alternative formats of your course files based on the original. Uh, these formats are made available with the original file so students can find everything in one convenient location. You don't need to do anything as the instructor. Uh, when you upload content to Blackboard, these alternative formats are created for you. Uh, if you want, you can disable 
alternative formats for any individual content item. Let's take a look at this in action. Um, on your screen now is a demonstration course, um, a sample Blackboard course. Just checking my other device to make sure that that's appearing on the screen. Great. So I'm navigating to the content in the course. Right now I'm viewing the course as an instructor. I'm actually going to change that view uh, to a student view so we can first talk about the alternative formats that are available to students. So Ally can provide alternative formats for PDF, Word, PowerPoint, OpenOffice, LibreOffice, and HTML file types. A student can view the list of alternative formats available for a file by selecting the Ally menu beside a file attached to your course and then selecting alternative formats. I'm going to do that now. So the first file that appears um, on this page is a PowerPoint file titled Traditions Before. Um, because Ally is enabled in the course, there is an Ally alternative formats icon displayed next to the file name. So I'm going to select that. And here I'm presented with different options for downloading an alternative file type. Uh, the formats generated depend on the original file uploaded, but they include tagged PDF, which is a structured PDF for improved use with assistive technology, HTML for viewing in the browser and on mobile devices, EPUB for reading as an ebook on the iPad or with other ebook readers, electronic Braille, um, which is a Braille ready format or BRF file for use with electronic Braille displays, audio, which is an MP3 version for listening, translated version, uh, which is a machine translated version of the original document, think Google Translate. And then Beeline Reader, which is an enhanced version for easier and faster on-screen reading. So a student would select uh, which of these formats they wish to download and then select download in order to do that. I mentioned that as an instructor, you can disable the av availability of those. I'm going to switch into the instructor view now to show how to do that. So I'm leaving uh, the student view of the course, which simply provides the ability to download alternative files and returning to the instructor view. So when you're logged into a course as an instructor, sorry, things are a little slow, um, either on the home internet or with Blackboard server this morning. Okay, so as an instructor, um, you would select alternative formats and then if you wished to disable downloading of a specific content item, you could select the menu next to download alternative formats and disable alternative formats for this file. If you change your mind and wish to re-enable them or enable them, you would then select enable for this file. Alternative formats are absolutely necessary for some, um, and, but beneficial for everyone. Um, alternative formats can provide higher quality alternatives to original course files. The readability of course materials can affect how students comprehend them um, and their study practices. So if the original course file is a scanned PDF that students can't highlight, copy paste, or keyword search, they might try the OCR to PDF for an editable, easier to read document. Or if the font of the original document is hard to read, they could try the EPUB format to customize the font and contrast with their e-reader device or software. Alternative formats can enhance understanding. When we engage different senses, like reading a text and listening to a text, we activate different parts of our brains, which can enhance our understanding. 
So students might try reading the tagged PDF first and then listening to the audio MP3 for review. Or if they're struggling to understand the text, they might try listening and reading at the same time. Alternative formats can improve time management. Um, students can read more easily on a mobile device with, let's say, the HTML format, or if they're commuting, um, they might use that audio file in order to listen to their readings um, in the car, just giving them a little bit of extra time to review their materials. And finally, for students with disabilities, Blackboard Ally creates the alternatives that are necessary for access. So audio and electronic braille alternatives for students with visual impairments, or that semantic HTML for use with screen readers and other assistive technologies. Alternative formats are student facing. The remaining features we'll look at today are for use by instructors and instructional designers and are not visible to students. I'll emphasize that again. The accessibility indicators and the course accessibility report are not visible to students. So first, the accessibility score indicators. Ally checks accessibility for new and existing course content. Uh, to measure accessibility, Ally assigns your content an accessibility score. Each score is comprised of both a number and a colored gauge that reflects that number. We'll return to our demonstration course to take a look at this. So uh, the colored gauges, the next to each file are the accessibility score indicators. A high score is indicated with a green icon. It means your file is more accessible. There's also text labels. So for example, as I'm hovering over uh, this green accessibility indicator, I can see that the associated accessibility score is perfect. Let's do another one. Accessibility score high. So higher scores are indicated with a green icon, meaning your files or those files are more accessible, while a red icon means the file is less accessible. You can select the icon to view the accessibility score and open the instructor feedback. So I'm gonna do that now by selecting this low score icon next to the UA Traditions Before Word document. When you select the accessibility score indicator, Ally shows you a preview of the document's content, as well as detailed feedback and support to help you fix your accessibility issues. Uh, you can use the tools above the preview to explore the issues in your document. So above the preview, um, there's the ability to navigate between pages of the document, which I'm doing now. There's the ability to navigate between the issues in the document. There is the ability to toggle on and off the visual highlights that sort of help you locate uh, the accessibility issue in the document. Um, the ability to zoom in and out, as well as to download the original file. So you can use these tools above the preview to explore the issues in the document. You can select all issues in the right sidebar to view every issue in the file. So I'm going to do that now. The all issues view shows you all of the issues in the file, as well as how much the score can improve by fixing each issue. So for example, by fixing the issue, this document contains images that are missing a description. Um, Ally tells us we can increase the accessibility score up to 47%. You can select fix to learn more about each issue and why it's important to fix. I'm gonna go ahead and select fix for that issue, the image description issue. You can select what this means to learn more about the issue. I'm going to do that now. So we're learning more about the issue. Um, in this case, what an image description is and why it's important to use image descriptions. You can 
Also access step-by-step uh, -step instructions to learn how to fix the issue in your preferred software. I'm selecting how to add descriptions. Uh, because this is a Word document, I'm provided with instructions uh, for three kinds of software that can uh, edit Word documents. Microsoft Office 365, Microsoft Office 2016, and LibreOffice. Um, so step-by-step, step, we're giving destruction, instructions for fixing this. So we're told to locate or download the original document, and then we'd select the authoring tool we use to create it or that we have access to. So I work mostly with Microsoft Office 365, so I'm choosing that now. And I'm given step-by-step -step instructions for how to add image, image descriptions in my document, as well as some guidance on how to write a good image description. I'm told to repeat these steps for all of the images in the document and then save it. I'm gonna select next. And now I'm prompted to upload the revised version of the file with the image descriptions. This uploaded revised version will replace the original document in the course. So as we've seen, uh, Ally provides you with detailed feedback and support to help you learn about accessibility issues, why they matter, and how to fix them. You select the accessibility score to open up that instructor feedback, follow the steps in front of you to go step by step, or select all issues to see every issue in the file and decide what issues to fix first. In addition to this file level information, Ally provides a course accessibility report that provides an accessibility summary and overview at the course level, showing an accessibility score for the course, distribution of course content by content type, and a list of all of the accessibility issues identified in a course. Instructors see their course content items that have issues, Instructors can then access the instructor feedback from the report to fix the issue. You can use this report to help you determine uh, the priority for remediating issues um, or access different options for order of fixing. For example, content with the most severe issues first or start with content that is the easiest to fix. Let's take a look at the course accessibility report in our demo course. I'm accessing that through the left sidebar. I'm selecting course tools and then course accessibility report. That's opening now. This is a course accessibility report for our UA Ally course, our demo course. At the top on the left, we have our overall course accessibility score of 49%. Below this, we have different boxes. One of the boxes uh, visually on the left side of the screen is showing all course content. I'm kind of hovering my mouse cursor around it now. So it's visually indicating through a chart, as well as some text, the amount of PDFs, the amount of Word documents, presentation, images, and HTML files. There's a view button, which when selected, as I'm doing now, is going to take you to a list of all of the content in that course, so that the instructor or instructional designer can choose to navigate through the accessibility improvements this way. By default, low scoring content is listed first, but you can switch that view by selecting the score header, and it will switch to showing the top rated content first. You can see the file name for each content item. So in this first row, the file named scanned document is a PDF, and it has a 0% score. So if the instructor would like to start fixing this item from here, all they would need to do is select the score icon that's showing the 0%.
and that will launch the instructor feedback um, just as it would be launched by selecting the accessibility score icon next to uh, a content item in the course. Returning to the overview, the second way instructors can interact with this report is the box visually at the top right where it says content with the easiest issues to fix. There are six content items. Pressing the start button as I'm doing now is going to take us to a view uh, listing all of the content items, showing the issues per document, and then the score. And again, selecting the score icon as I'm doing now will launch the instructor feedback again. One moment while I clear my throat. Let's go back to the overview. The third option is fix low scoring content. And again, pressing the start button as I'm doing now is going to give you a list of all the content items that are low scoring, showing the issues per document and then the score. And again, selecting the score icon will launch the instructor feedback again. Returning to the overview, the final way instructors can use this report is to see a list of the accessibility issues that exist in a course. So all of the accessibility issues in the course. As you scroll further down the screen under the heading of remaining issues, there's one row per issue. So for example, the first row indicates that there is uh, one piece of content, one item affected by the issue um, of being scanned but not OCR'd. If I select that row, Ally will show me the documents that are affected by this particular issue. I'm going to return back to the list of all issues in the course um, to look at an example where there's more than one content item affected. So uh, the second row, we have the issue, the document has contrast issues that affects seven uh, pieces of content or files. So I'm going to select that row and we can see that this issue is present in um, a couple of PDFs, a couple of Word documents, and three presentation files. And again, if we wanted to access the instructor feedback and be walked step by step through the process of fixing this issue, we would select the accessibility score um, in order to launch the instructor feedback. So I'm going to stop our look at Blackboard Ally here. That is uh, all of the new information I have for you today. I'm going to stop the recording. If you have questions or thoughts to share, please feel free to unmute your mic and share them now or type them in the chat box.